Today, our scripture reading comes from the Revised Common Lectionary, and so that we can know as we hold the story in our heart and look for what it reveals to us, that people all around the world are looking at this very scripture from the Gospel of Luke, seekers of truth worldwide, focusing in upon these holy words. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Few things are necessary. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. So here we have this simple account of Jesus just making a distinction. Of course, tasks around the house that Martha were doing, of course, they were important, especially in entertaining company. But he was just making a distinction. There are the many deeds and actions we do in our everyday living, but we mustn't let them overwhelm us so that we forget those few necessary things, or we might say those essential aspects of living. In knowing our source, in holding one another in honor and respect, and being willing to cooperate and work together. Those essential principles. Well, today, I'm concluding which, what has been a three-week series, counting today, and I'm a little surprised because it's just seemed to fly by for me. It seems like I only started this yesterday. But it's time. Time for it to come to a closure. I entitled the series Summer Stories, Parables of Jesus. And today we are looking at the theme from the parables that speaks to us of our task, our work, our practice. But before we begin that, Let's take a moment to look at where we have been, what Jesus has shared with us through the parables that we have looked at, about five or six out of the nearly 40 that are recorded in the Gospels and in other uh, scriptures. That first week, we contemplated our source, our connection, our relationship to our Creator. You might remember that we looked at one of the most famous of Jesus' parables, the prodigal son. That young man that went off into the world and used up all of his energy, all of his inheritance, and then found himself in great lack and suffering. And then, as the parable says, He came to himself. He realized, wait, my father cares for his estate and all of his servants. I can go home in humility and ask to be cared for at least as well as one of his servants. But if you remember the story, as the young man journeyed home, what happened? the father ran out onto the road and met him with great joy and with great ceremony placed an impressive robe on him and a ring on his finger and asked the staff or the servants to prepare a meal of celebration for his son who was lost had been found and came home. So that remembering the place from which we come 
or we might say the spiritual realm from which each of us come. But there are times in our life that we have surely forgotten our origins. And we begin to think of ourselves as being a product of perhaps a family, a place that we lived, our education, our career. Many of these things of the world, we substitute and make them the source, our origin. But here in the story that Jesus shares, the prodigal son remembers. He comes to himself and he returns home. We also had the parable of the wedding banquet recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And I cautioned you that many of the parables in Matthew end with kind of a gloomy ending. Usually the character that does not get it right ends up being tossed out into what is described as outer darkness where there is gnashing of teeth and weeping. Well, that doesn't sound like much fun, but I'm not sure it'd be too nice today to be tossed out into the outer heat either. But it just sums up the story that the character that did not live by the spiritual principle that Jesus was illustrating would find himself or herself in a world that was not pleasant and there would be unhappiness. The wedding banquet was also a story of source as well. The master, that is God, the master throws a great feast and all the VIPs in the community, all the important people are invited. And remember what happened? They didn't come. They didn't have time. One was busy with his land. One was busy with as a merchant. They were all too busy in their individual lives to show up for the wonderful banquet that their master had prepared. So as the story goes, those who were receptive, willing to enter the banquet hall, those were the ones who were there. And those were the ones that received the blessing Last week, we looked at a couple of stories that spoke to us of our receptivity. What are we willing to receive? What are we willing to know through the gifts of God? One was the story of the sower, the one who sowed the seeds, and some fell upon the path, And remember what happened? The wild things, the birds, came and ate the good seed thoughts that were given. And then there were the seeds that were cast up on the rocky soil. And they grew up, sometimes like we do, with great enthusiasm and joy. But then when the heat comes out of the noonday sun and things become a little more difficult... We lose our enthusiasm, and like those little seedlings, we quickly fade and shrivel up. Then there was the good seed that was cast upon the thorny soil, and the thorn was the negativity, the criticism, the condemning, and those good seeds were choked out by the negativity, and they could not prosper. But then Jesus ends the story. Finally, there was good seed that fell upon a good and ready soul. That is, our open and receptive hearts and minds. And that seed germinated and grew. And as he tells the story, the seed multiplied 30, 40, 60, 100 fold. So our receptivity has a lot to do with the prosperity, the satisfaction, the fulfillment of our life. To be able to receive the good thoughts that God places in our hearts and minds and to nourish them, to not forget them, so that they may grow and prosper. 
Well, today we're turning our attention to some other stories that speak to us of our practice. So in that first week, we have remembered where we have come from as God's creation. In the second week, we looked at what are we willing to listen to? What are we willing to receive? What are we willing to care for? This week, we look at practice. We've been given many good gifts. What are we willing to put to work? Now, before we get to the practice, we have an interesting little question to ask ourselves. Have any of you felt challenged lately with any sense of loss? Is there anything that's missing in your life? Well, you know, my good example, if you're here every week and you know me, you know, I seem to have lost or misplaced my health in recent months. And so I'm looking to refine that. I told somebody this week that um, it had been nine months since this strange pneumonia came upon me. And I said, nine months? Ooh, that sounds like my health is about to be reborn. Reborn. (laughs) Nine months seems like a very appropriate time. And so it is. And so it is. But we may have a sense that we've lost our joy our enthusiasm, our interest in our work, our career. And Jesus offers these two short uh, stories of the lost. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So that seeking for what has been lost. A short story that comes with that is called the parable of the lost coin. It's very similar. What woman, Jesus says, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. But you see, both of these stories speak to us of that necessity of looking for the lost making an effort to seek what in our life we may have felt has drifted away. For if we seek, we will find it. If we seek, we will find it. So we turn now to our main parable, the parable known as the... um, Talents. If I turn to the right page, there. The parable of the talents. So Jesus is teaching and says, For it is if a man going on a journey summons his servants and entrusts entrusts his property to them. To one he gave five talents. And a little footnote here. A talent in that day was worth 15 years of common labor. 15 years of labor. So that's what one talent was worth. So we're not talking about a quarter or a 50 cent piece. We're talking about something very substantial. 
So the master gives to one five talents. To another servant he gives one. To each according to his ability. Then the master went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents out of his labor. The one who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled his accounts with them. Then one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received just one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy servant, You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Then you have, then you ought to have invested my money at least with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for the worthless servant, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, these parables as recorded in Matthew's gospel are sometimes called challenge parables or you might say challenging parable. That doesn't sound very charitable there toward the end as Jesus tells the story that those that have much will receive even more and those who have little, even what they have will be taken away. But it's kind of like the cliche that we often hear in the world Use it or you'll lose it. In other words, this is not so much of a story as of one's daily bread and that it's going to be taken away from those who have so little. But it's more of a story of the master giving talents or we may interpret it as God giving us spiritual gifts. And it is for us through our living, to put them to work, to multiply, to see that they are a blessing, not only meeting our individual needs, but meeting the needs of our world as well. So we have to look beyond the obvious of the story and realize that Jesus is trying to get us to have a practice, to strive, to work in our life, first in seeking, in seeking any aspect of our life that may not seem whole or complete. What am I missing? Look for it. I look to refine for myself 
my health and vitality. I look for it, I seek it, and then I do what will support my renewed health. We can do that in many ways. If any of you have ever, and I have, and I don't find it a very pleasant experience to have a sense of hopelessness or no joy in life, that can be a real downer. But that first step, like the lost coin and the lost sheep, the first step is to seek what we feel we have lost, what is lacking in our life. Look for it. And then further, practice in our life what makes for that quality. Another simple cliche or little truth statement is, do you want to have a friend in your life? then go be someone's friend. You want to know generous people? Then you yourself be generous, open-hearted, open-minded. Listen to how others think and feel. See what's important to them. Don't always approach them with what is important to me. But I want to hear what's important to Fran. So that generosity of spirit can go a long way to what? You refining, rediscovering your own generosity, joy, health, abundance. All these things that We need, as Jesus said, the Father knows you need these things. But first, seek the kingdom. That is, seek your spiritual connection, your source, your receptivity to good, to God. And now practice. Put those talents to work. So Jesus has led us through these several parables over the last three weeks to sort of an inner awakening or a recharging for us. I was playing with some words this week, and I was thinking, well, what else is Jesus teaching us? about life. That we have abundance, we have health, we have joy. When we're in, as Eric Butterworth calls it, the flow of life, when we work with life and not against it. And it reminded me of a little word play I heard somewhere along the line of my life. If we look at the word To live. To live. It's an energizing word. It has a nice L and a nice V. It's an energizing live. But if we work against life, take that little word live. Now use your mind, your inner blackboard. If you live backwards, what is that word spelled backwards? People know that. You've heard it before. No, but it's a, it's a truth. That live backwards is evil. If we work against life, if we work against life through destructive, condemning, violent behavior, we're living backwards. We may call it evil. And I was thinking of this month of our Independence Day. We're thinking about elections in the fall and a lot to do with our government. And a lot true around the world. And I was thinking and heard someone mention that famous statement 
that is like the dream guide of our American family. It comes from the great seal of the United States. That Latin phrase, you know it. E pluribus unum. E pluribus unum. Who can translate it into English for me? Out of many, one. Out of many people, out of a great diversity, one division, excuse me, one vision or goal, the dream, the hope that is our America. Now, if we were to turn that word around in Latin, it might be unum de multis, unum de multis, out of one, many. And here we've taken the great guide of the American dream and we've reversed it. And what do we have? Something that we are facing in our diverse culture now. Out of one, many. In other words, what one person does in violence or crime, we now place that upon the many. All who are like that criminal in any way. By doing that, what have we forgotten? We've forgotten the unique individuality, the unique creation of that individual. So we have to be very careful that we hold that great truth statement out of many, one vision, one focus, and don't pervert it and use it backwards and say, aha, look what this person in my community did. You know those people are all alike. It's a temptation because we live in a very diverse family in this country. It's changing every year. I recently went with some friends down to uh, southern Missouri, um, to the town of Ozark, and saw a tourist attraction there called the Small and Civil War Cave. And the guide was wonderful, telling about all the diverse history of this wonderful cave creation. It's uh, unique in our entire state of uh, Missouri in many ways I won't go into. But he talked about the Osage Indians that were the first to cherish it and to use it. And then along came members of the Cherokee Nation on their trail of tears from the eastern states to their forced new home in Oklahoma. And about a thousand families got away in the Springfield area and hid out. And wouldn't you know, there was a family named Stacy in 1838 that moved into that cave, and they were known um, for living there and for welcoming other Cherokee refugees who had gotten away from the army in that forced march, and they welcomed them in. Then the cave turned to the Civil War period, and it became a place of shelter, storage, and even recreation on the nearby grounds for the Union Army during the Civil War period period. In our century and closer to our time, if you can imagine, it became a church camp. And one of the churches from Springfield would not only have recreation, but they would have revivals in the cave. How would you like to go to a revival and be saved in a cave? But all, it struck me, all the diversity of history and I felt a little bit sad in the sense that I thought, I have forgotten more history of my own family 
in my own community, then I remember. I know a little bit, and I've forgotten so much. So that's just a way to illustrate the great diversity of our country and how careful we must be to remember the individuality, the spiritual principle of the individual, and not say, unum de multis, out of one, I see the many. Those people are all alike. We must remember our spiritual principles. And I believe that is our mission and our gift to the world in our unity family worldwide. And, of course, there are other truth seekers as well. Uh, As the Fillmore said, unity is not the only, but it's our work. And so unity is our work. That we look at spiritual principles and how they prepare us to meet this world that we live in. There are many challenges And there's much outer work, rescue work, restoration work, feeding and meeting the needs of those who don't have enough. This is important charitable work. But we want to begin, as Jesus did with these parables, in getting the essential first, remembering our connection to source, being open and receptive to what it reveals to us, and then putting it to practice in our world through all that we choose to do in all the relationships that we have. So let's take time now and turn within for a time of meditation and silence because it is in this inner place of peace that we can hear the still small voice of spirit. So I invite you to turn your attention within. And you may choose first to just become aware of the breathing of your body. It's a wonderful way to slow down one's thoughts and any sense of anxiety or agitation. To just focus attention upon the breathing. It's wonderful rhythm. It draws in from the outer world. And then the body exhales. Once we are at rest, we have the privilege that our spiritual guide, the spirit of truth, is always accessible. The writer of the psalm used those wonderful words, God, a very present help in time of need. So like the prodigal son, we can remember through the silence of prayer to turn within say, Dear Spirit, I feel I have lost something. Something seems to be lacking. I don't feel whole, complete, joyful. Help me find that which I have lost. And we rest for a few moments. to allow the guidance of spirit to be revealed to us each in his or her own way.
we will remember the wonderful promise found in Matthew's Gospel. Seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be opened for you. So in this time of silence, we can trust the Spirit to reveal not only what may be lost or lacking in our life, but how we may search for it, guidance as to how we may rebuild it for our well-being and the well-being of others. And so gently we now allow our attention to begin to return to this outer sanctuary. And to simply remind ourselves that through prayer, through time in the silence, we have called for Spirit's aid, Spirit's guidance. Now we must trust, if not in this very moment of silence, that in days to come, an opportunity will come to us a person will approach us and somehow we will realize that we have the opportunity to begin to repair, rebuild what we feel we have lost by offering that very quality to our world. St. Francis in that beautiful prayer gave us a whole series of of statements. You know them, you're familiar with them. That we not so seek to be understood as to understand. And so there is our practice. There is how we may put our talents to work in our world. And so I encourage you as your homework this week Be open and receptive to how you can put your God-given talent to work in this world. You will be blessed and all will will be blessed.